Okay. Um, my name is Joe Lee, and my uh, research is on uh, paradoxical groups and the sets they act upon. Um, the major result in this field is called the Banach-Tarski paradox, and this is a theorem by two Polish mathematicians uh, published in 1923. And what their theorem says is that um, if you take a ball and you cut it up into nine pieces and you rearrange those nine pieces, what you can actually do is you can form two balls that are actually identical to the one you started with. And hence, that's why we have a paradox. Um, it shouldn't be able to happen because what happened is we just, just by cutting up the pieces we, and moving them around, we doubled the volume. So if you look at, at this figure, what, what should happen is if you have two figures like we do here, A and B, and if you, in the bottom right, if you cut the top off of A and move it off to the side to make B, um, you can argue that A and B have the same area. And this is what you expect to happen. When you cut something apart uh, and move the pieces around, you wouldn't expect the size to change. But that's what we have with the Banach-Tarski paradox. So I'm not going to give, uh, go into details of the proof, but I, I would like to um, uh, explain sort of the historical importance and where it fits into the math world today. So. Okay, so going back even further to uh, 1638, uh, to an Italian mathematician you've probably heard of, uh, Galileo Galilei, what he noticed was, if you took the set of natural numbers, which sometimes we call them the counting numbers, so this would be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and so forth, so forth, you could divide these numbers up into two sets. And what Galileo did was he divided them up into the set of uh, squares, which is what we have on the left, which is 1, 4, 9, 16, 25, and so forth, and the set of numbers that are not squares, so that's everything else, 2, 3, 5, 6, 7, 8, 10, and so forth. And what he said was that these numbers are equinumerous with the set of natural numbers. Or in other words, if you take the set of natural numbers and split them apart, you actually get two sets that are identical to the set you started with, which was the natural numbers. So this is why it's sort of like the Panoptarsity paradox. Um, Galileo did have an explanation for this, and what he said was that the concept of size does not apply when you have infinite sets, and that's what uh, the set of natural numbers is, it's an infinite set. And he was, for the most part, correct. I mean, he was, he was correct in, in the sense that with, with uh, the natural numbers that he was dealing with, the infinite sets were, had the same size. Um, uh, more accurately, another mathematician, uh, George Cannon, came along, uh, he's, uh, referred to as the founder of set theory, so this is a really important mathematician. And um, what he said was, um, you can distinguish between the size between infinite sets, um, but the sets that Galileo was working with, we can say those have the same size, or as we say, cardinality. But um, that that doesn't still doesn't help us answer why the Banach-Tarski paradox uh, works, because uh, the with the Banach-Tarski paradox, we have a ball with finite volume, and we move it around and we double the volume. So it's it's, it's different and, and and more paradoxical than what Galileo said. So the question is, um, how does this work, or why does it work? And the first answer that mathematicians came up with is that it doesn't work. Okay, there there's a mistake, and their argument was that um, they they uh, they use this what they call the axiom of choice. And that was the mistake, and that this axiom actually doesn't work. And so what this axiom says is that if you're given an infinite number of sets, you can, you're can you able to make a selection from each set. Okay. And this is often described as, in, as the sock and the shoe problem. So what, what the sock and the shoe problem says, if you're given an infinite number of pairs of shoes, it'd be easy to make a selection from the, from the shoes. For example, you could take every left shoe. Okay. But if you were given an infinite number of pairs of socks, it wouldn't be easy because the socks are indistinguishable. So you wouldn't be able to um, make a selection. But what the axiom of choice says is that even though that you can't sort of name a selection easily, that it would, it's nevertheless possible that there's a set that picks one from each, each of the uh, collections here. So, so um, what it turns out is that the, the axiom of choice, and, and this is why one of the real important reasons the Banach-Tarski paradox is really important, is because 
Uh, mathematicians used it to say the axiom of choice shouldn't be accepted. Okay? But um, what, what we realize is that the axiom of choice itself is pretty intuitive, and that if we rejected it, like some mathematicians originally suggested, that it would cause more problems than the Banach-Tarski paradox causes anyways, so that uh, re really this isn't our problem. Okay? So we're still left with why, why does it happen? Well, what, what we uh, decided was the answer is that um, these sets that we, uh, that um, Banach and Tarski divided the sphere up into are actually what we say are non-measurable. And what, I'm, what we mean by that is um, exactly what the Banach Tarski paradox says. So when you measure these sets one way, they, 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 they have some measure, but when you move them around, the measure changes. So in effect, they really don't have any measure. If, if, if the measure changes by how you move them, um, you can't really say anything about the measure. And, and the reason, the reason this, um, this, this works is there's a difference between what we see in the math world as opposed to what we see in the real world. So in the real world, we know that this isn't possible. I mean, we, 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 it, it would be nice if it was, because the things you could do if you could sort of you know, take your one scoop of ice cream and cut it up and, and make two scoops of ice cream out of it would be nice. But unfortunately, you can't actually do that, because in the real world, um, everything, has, everything is measurable. Okay? E even down to as small as like an atom or an electron, it has some sort of measure. Okay? But in the math world, when we think of the points of a ball or points of a sphere, um, we don't think of these points as having any size in and of themselves. We think of them as uh, locations on, on the sphere. So, so whereas in the math world, we can break it up uh, into a, as small as pieces as we want. In, in actuality, we can't do this at all. Um, so, so that's just um, the Banach-Tarski paradox is is the major uh, result in the field of paradoxical groups. Um, uh, our research we did um, not only covered the Banach-Tarski paradox, but we talked about other things. For instance, uh, the effect, the role that free groups play in this, and in what cases that these paradoxes uh, wouldn't apply in what Euclidean spaces, in particular, the uh, number line and the plane. And that is it. I, I would like to thank my advisor, Dr. Rosanowski, and I would like to thank Dr. Elder, who is on my uh, thesis committee. You're very helpful. <laughs> Any questions? Well, I, I have to ask. So, so you said the, uh, the plane and the, the number line, but you didn't really explain the difference between what happens in 3D and what happens in the plane. So, so the difference between, and, and that was with the bullet above it, I don't, um, yeah. so, so the difference between the plane and the number line and the ball, which is in three-dimensional space, is the three groups here. So in, in, in three-dimensional space, there's a free group of rotations where you're able to, to do this, whereas on, on the number line and the plane, the transformations that you can make um, they, they don't consist of a free group like they do in... So it, it, it has to do with the group of rotations. So I mean, there's a group of movements you can make. In, in, in three-dimensional space, you can make different movements when you rotate and stuff, but whereas on the number line or plane, you can't make those same movements, and, and thus it doesn't exist. <laughs>